Good morning. So, um, so I want to spend the next three lectures on stereochemistry on chapter three in your book, and this is a this is a fun subject because it's very conceptual. I mean, organic chemistry really is about thinking, it's about understanding, it's about visualizing, and stereochemistry is one of the big areas, one of the defining areas that makes organic chemistry. So I'm going to spend three lectures this week on the topic of stereochemistry, and I think what I'll do is I'll break it up sort of into the first one being on properties of stereoisomers. The second one I think I'll call concepts in stereochemistry. We'll discuss topism and really get an idea of the, the idea of different stereoisomeric positions and stereochemical faces. And the third lecture we'll talk about stereospecific reactions and we'll see some of the things that one sees at a graduate level about how stereochemistry of reactants translate into stereochemistry of products, not, not so much SN2, which you've learned with inversion, Walden inversion, inversion of a stereocenter, but more maybe thinking about six-membered ring transition states and beginning to visualize things in our head. As I said, you can have an entire course on stereochemistry. I have a book more than a thousand pages in length, and so we're obviously picking and choosing. But I want us to be able to go more in depth than in, uh, than in the sophomore class. So what do we mean by stereochemistry? We mean chemistry in three dimensions. In other words, the fact that carbon is tetrahedral allows the, and, and in some cases other facts about molecular geometry give molecules three-dimensional shapes that result in unique properties and specifically different properties of different stereoisomers. So okay, stereoisomers. Well, we all know what isomers are. Isomers have the same molecular formula. Stereoisomers also have, in addition to the same molecular formula, the same atomic connectivity In other words, carbon-1 will still be connected to carbon-2, and carbon-2 might have an oxygen on it, and carbon-2 might also be connected to carbon-3, and carbon-3 might have something on it, but different three-dimensional structures. And as a result of having different three-dimensional structures, stereoisomers will have different physico-chemical or chiro-optical properties. So by physico-chemical properties, I mean things like melting point, boiling point, retention time on or RF on TLC or retention time by gas chromatography. By chiro-optical properties, I mean different rotation of plane polarized light, different circular dichroism, different rotation, uh, different, different uh, rotation of circularly polarized light and so forth. Whenever I start talking about stereoisomers, at least beyond the freshman level or the sophomore level where you get R and S, which I think everyone is on top of, I like to start with tartaric acid. Tartaric acid is a cool molecule because it demonstrates for us a lot of these properties 
tartaric acid also really is the genesis of the history of stereochemistry. So this is the structure of tartaric acid. Without any stereochemistry drawn in, I'll draw it in in a moment. But tartaric acid really is where concepts in stereochemistry started. And Louis Pasteur, I mean, back in the 19th century, you weren't per se a chemist or a biologist. You were more of a scientist of all different sorts. And Louis Pasteur was a very practical scientist. He was employed by various you know, dairy and beer industries and wine industries to figure out what was going on with the uh, fermentation and with animals and so forth. And one of the things that he did, tartaric acid is in wine, one of the things he noticed was that the crystals formed by tartaric acid, ammonium tartrate and specifically, had a right-handed shape and a left-handed shape. In other words, you could actually see under some conditions you could form, you could identify crystals that had mirror image relationships to each other. And this got him thinking because it was very, very cool. And I got to see these crystals last summer. I was actually in, uh, in Lille, France for a month or for a week rather. And I got to visit Louis Pester's lab, and they had you know, his lab bench, and they had some of the crystals of tartaric acid. It was very cool. But he was astute enough to realize this is special when you have right-handed crystals and left-handed crystals, and somehow the molecules had to differ. Now, back in 1848, when he made this observation, we didn't even know, you know carbon was tetrahedral. But this got people thinking, and this was the first way people began to understand the structure of carbon atom, of the sp3 carbon atom. Heck, we didn't have the concept of sp3 hybridization. So Pasteur figured that if the crystals were handed, somehow the molecules were handed. And then by about 1874, Van Toff and Labelle separately theorized that carbon, with four things attached to it, had those four substituents in a tetrahedral arrangement. And this would mean that you could have one-handed arrangement or another-handed arrangement. So tartaric acid sort of serves as a nice genesis. All right, so what's cool in terms of tartaric acid is we have three different stereoisomers. We have the 2R, 3R tartaric acid. This is the common natural tartaric acid. It's the predominant form, the predominant enantiomer you find in grapes and wine. If you ever open a bottle of wine and you see little crystals on the inside of the cork, those are crystals of a tartrate salt, so tartrate's readily available. In fact, in wine barrels, you can see big white, white sort of reddish white because of the wine uh, layers of the crystals. It's cheap. It's, um, it happens to be about five cents a gram. So in other words, dirt cheap. 2S, 3S tartaric acid is the enantiomer. 2S, 3, 3S tartaric acid is natural, but it's often called unnatural. I'll say uncommon or unnatural. I'll put unnatural in quotes but it comes from natural sources. If you want to go buy it, the last time I checked, it's, um, it's about 60 cents per gram. Numbers aren't important here, but Barry Sharpless, who won the Nobel Prize for asymmetric synthesis, used tartaric acid as a ligand in an epoxidation reaction and the relatively cheap, I mean 60 cents a gram still isn't very expensive, the relatively cheap availability of both enantiomers of tartaric acid allowed him to make reagents 
that would make either epoxide, in other words, one enantiomer of tartaric acid would make one epoxide, the other would make the other epoxide. This is a concept that's going to be a theme running through this lecture and subsequent lectures is the idea that it takes chirality to make chirality and to detect and distinguish chirality. Now, the third stereoisomer is the 2R3S tartaric acid. That's the same, by the way. That's equivalent to the 2S3R tartaric acid. I'll show you they're one and the same in just a second. They're meso compound. They're called meso. They're a meso compound, so they are the same meso tartaric acid. And incidentally, I once did a project where I wanted meso tartaric acid to try to invert one of the stereocenters on it. It is really unnatural, really made synthetically, not available. It happened to be, when I was doing this project, $12 per gram. Don't worry about the numbers, but the point is, the point is that in your pocketbook, in your wallet, there are distinctions between stereoisomers. But let's talk about those distinctions in the laboratory. Now, I think where I want to go first is to make sure we have a clear opinion about stereoisomers, a clear understanding of stereoisomers, and sort of take us back to that Kahn Engold prelog notation that I expect everyone to, to at this point be on top of. I guess the other thing to do is to show you my thinking about how I would say draw one of these enantiomers of tartaric acid or one of the diastereomers. What I would do is just arbitrarily, I mean my way of, and this applies kind of to our, um, to the homework problems on chapter one and two, is when I'm trying to figure out a stereoisomer, usually what I'll do is just arbitrarily draw my stereocenters and not worry before I draw. Then I'll figure out what I've drawn and invert it if necessary. So in other words, I look at this molecule and I say, OK, for this stereocenter, for the two stereocenter, well, OK, we're citing down the bond to the hydrogen already, so it's convenient for me to look at, which is why I drew it this way. That's our top priority, right? This is number one. A carbon with two and really three oxygens attached to it is priority number two. And this carbon with one oxygen attached to its carbon three, so this is an S stereocenter. I do the same over here. This is an S stereocenter. So the tartaric acid I've drawn here, wait a sec, did I? Did I, did I, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. So I've got 2S, 3S tartaric acid. Whoops. over here. Now if I want to draw the other stereoisomers, it's very easy because I just invert the stereocenters, right? So I just go ahead and say now if I want to draw the enantiomer, I draw, I just go ahead, invert both stereocenters. And this is going to be 2R, 3R tartaric acid. So this is our so-called natural isomer. And then if I want to make the mesodiastereomer, so these two are enantiomers. And then if I want to make the mesostereoisomer, I just go ahead and invert one of the centers. And so let's say I'll start with this center the way I had drawn it originally, and I will invert this center, and this is going to be the uh, 2R3S 
2S3R, pardon me, 2S3R tartaric acid, which is exactly the same. In other words, it is exactly the same. There is no distinction between the, although I might draw it over here in the opposite fashion, there is no distinction. These are identical, and in fact, there is not a, it is not that this is different. In other words, if I call this the 2R3S tartaric acid, it is the exact same molecule. They're not different, they just have drawn them differently. In other words, if I spin about this axis here, about the axis that my, uh, my marker is creating, we get the same molecule. And there's not, it's not one or the other. It is both, they are both meso tartaric acid. Oops. And so, as I said, the meso compound is a diastereomer of the 2R, 2R, uh, or the 2S, 3S. Thoughts or questions? Yeah. Is there a way to check to see if they are meso? Ah! Great question. Is there a way to check to see if they are meso? So, Meso compounds have a plane of symmetry in them or a center of symmetry. And I think the easiest way to see this plane of symmetry is just to envision, let's take our tartaric acid that I've drawn, the compound I claim to be the meso compound. And let us imagine rotating about this bond, like so. So I'm going to do a 180 degree rotation. Pick that up and rotate it in your head. So now, Can you see how I rotated that? Rotate about this bond, this OH, this carboxylic acid group that was in the plane, moves into the plane here. This OH that was behind the plane comes out. There was a hydrogen projecting out. That's going back, and you can see the plane of symmetry. Other questions? That's a really, really important question. How many of you still have your plastic models from Chem 51? How many of you have taken your plastic models out of, Chem 50, out of the packaging and played with them? Okay. These plastic models are extremely useful for visualizing these types of structures. So folks had come to my office hours on Friday, and it was very nice. And immediately, I was getting out my plastic models when we were talking about, say, the bicyclo-331 heptane uh, nonane system, octane, uh, nonane system, or the bicyclo-2. 221 heptane system. So these are very useful to have. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the 
properties of the tartaric acid stereoisomers. And I think this really, I mean, this is just like I said with the price, this is not about the details. This is about the big picture, because what I'm talking about here, tartaric acid becomes an archetype for all different sorts of enantiomers and for meso compound, and helps us also see the differences between enantiomers and between diastereomers. Okay, so the properties, and obviously I'm just going to take a, a couple of these. I'll say stereoisomers, etc. And I want to give us three of these. So the 2R, 3R, the so-called natural, has a melting point of 172 degrees. In other words, if I put it in a capillary tube and heat the capillary tube up, I see it liquefy at 170 degrees. And it has an optical rotation, a specific rotation of 12.4 degrees. This property is called specific rotation. And this is basically a measure of how much a compound rotates plane polarized light. Who's ever had a pair of polarized sunglasses or played with polarizing filters? Okay, so the basic idea of Polaroid sunglasses is when sunlight hits, say, the water on, say, the ocean, on the beach, it comes off and it's polarized, which means now you have the electric and magnetic vectors oriented with respect to each other. Polarized lenses block out polarized light in one orientation and let it through in another. And if you put two polarizing sunglasses against each other in one orientation, when they're orthogonal to each other, they're completely black, they're completely opaque. In another orientation, they let light through. If I were to put a sample of tartaric acid in between them, it would change the angle of rotation by rotating the light. So instead of being perfectly aligned, now they would have to be shifted by some number of degrees one way or another. And this is what Pasteur noticed early on with the property of uh, enantiomers, that they would rotate plane polarized light. Specific rotation is a quantity that basically says, OK, if we have a certain concentration in grams per, uh, per deciliter, per 100 mils, and we have a path length, a certain path length of one decimeter, you're going to get this amount of rotation. It is like the quantity epsilon in Beer's law. A equals epsilon concentration path length. In the case of rotation, the observed rotation, that amount that the sunglasses have to be offset or the polarizing filters have to be offset, is equal to the specific rotation times the concentration in grams per 100 mils times the path length in decimeters. So basically, it's a normalization <laughs> factor. OK, so this, oh yeah, and the D means sodium D line, so sodium light if you have a sodium gas discharge, you get a light, I think it's at 589 nanometers or something. It's an orange light. If you've ever driven on highways in the East Coast, you might have seen sodium lamps. They give this orange glow. So basically, that particular light, that 589 nanometer light at 20 degrees Celsius, gets rotated by 12 degrees. All right, where am I going with this? If we take the enantiomer, the 2S, 3S tartaric acid, all of its non-chiral properties, its melting point, all the physical properties you would think of, the melting point, the boiling point, 
the retention on TLC are all identical. But properties that involve chirality, chiro-optical properties, rotation of plane polarized light, or interaction with other chiral molecules are going to differ. So in other words, the enantiomer of tartaric acid is going to have to have the same melting point. And that's true for every enantiomer. The optical rotation, the specific rotation, is going to be equal and opposite. In other words, it's going to be negative 12.4 degrees. What can we say about the melting point of mesotartaric acid? Different. Exactly. It's not, unless there's, by chance, it's not going to be the same. I mean, I guess you could say maybe there's a chance of one in a hundred it would be the same. But it's going to be different. We can't really predict it. You might have some idea, well, if tartaric acid is a solid and compounds with hydroxy groups like sugars are often solids, maybe t mesotartaric acid is likely to be a solid rather than a liquid. In other words, have a melting point above room temperature. But there's no particular way for us to know that the melting point is 147 degrees. We can, however, say something about the optical rotation. What can we say about the optical rotation of mesotartaric acid? Zero. Zero. It's no specific rotation. Alpha D equals zero. It's not what we would call optically active. I want to bring one more example to the table, and that is racemic tartaric acid. In other words, a mixture of enantiomers, what Pester would have probably noticed um, when he was able to pick apart the crystals. I don't know how he got his hands on racemic tartaric acid, or maybe it was partially racemic, but anyway, racemic tartaric acid is going to likely have a different melting point, just like the meso. Racemic compounds generally have a different melting point. In this case, the melting point is 206 degrees. And the optical rotation? Zero, right? Exactly the same thing. It takes a single-handedness to be able to rotate plain polarized light. And so that kind of catches these differences that we can see. In other words, the diastereomer has different physicochemical properties from the enantiomers. The mixture of enantiomers has special physicochemical properties of its own. In general, the enantiomers are optically active. The racemate and the meso compound are not optically active. So organic chemists are often interested in the degree of enantiomeric purity. For a couple of reasons. If I go ahead and I isolate some crystals off the cork of a wine bottle or out of a wine barrel, I want to know, are these crystals a single stereoisomer? Are they a mixture of stereoisomers? Now, obviously, if they have some optical rotation, I know they're not racemic. 
But the question becomes, how do we describe? Are they 100% one enantiomer? Are they partially one and partially another? Organic chemists often use the term percent enantiomeric excess to quantify how far we are away from the racemic compound. So obviously something that is purely one enantiomer would be 100% enantiomeric excess. Something that is purely racemic would be 0%. And we can quantify it and say the percentage of enantiomeric excess is equal to the percent R minus the percent S. So that's good if you know what's in there. So for example, a 2 to 1 mixture. So let's say we have a 2 to 1 mixture of the, let's say, um, 2R, 3R, and the 2S, 3S. So we would describe that 2 to 1 mixture as being, it's 2 to 1, so it's 66.6, shall we say, to 33.3. So that's a 66.6 to 33.3, or the percentage EE is the absolute value of 66.6 minus 33.3. We would call that 33% EE. Now, optical rotation is a great and traditional way because you can go ahead and me measure a property very simply. In other words, we're going to see in a moment how to, shall we say, count up the enantiomers to look at the molecules individually. But historically, what you could measure was optical rotation. So let's consider that same mixture, and let's do a, th a thought experiment. So consider that two-to-one mixture. Let's do a little thought experiment. What would we expect for the specific rotation? How do we think about that? Would it be a plane of the, of the two threes that it would rotate? It is indeed a third. Yeah, so it is one third of 12.4. How did you get to that point? What was your thinking on this? I was like, if it's purely racemic, I guess I was thinking that it would, the two counteract each other, but if the, the, I guess the leftover can do it. Yeah, exactly. So in other words, in that two to one mixture, we can think of it, it's two parts racemic plus one part of what did I say, 2R, uh, 2R, 3R? Exactly. So it's a third 2R, 3R. In other words, we would weigh out that whatever number of grams per deciliter, one gram per, decili per deciliter per 100 mils, but only a third of it would actually contribute to the rotation. So that is exactly the way we can think about it. And so a traditional way of talking about purity is percent optical purity because you're not looking at any, any molecular property, percent optical purity. And that is the specific rotation of the sample. <laughs> 
over the specific rotation of pure enantiomer. times 100%. And of course, that means that you have to, let's say Pasteur was able to pick apart a big pile of crystals and weigh out a gram of the picked apart crystals and measure the optical rotation and say, okay, that's my standard for 100% optical purity. Now here's a sample of tartaric acid. I measured it at 8.7 degrees specific rotation, that is 8.7 divided by 12.4 times 100% optical purity. So in this case, if you measured, so again, one third of, so imagine you measured 4.13 degrees, you would say, oh, my optical purity is my, my optical purity equals 4.13 divided by 12.4 is equal to 33%. And I would say, okay, I have a mixture of two parts of one enantiomer and one part or an of another. Or using a more modern term, we would say I have a 33% EE. Thoughts or questions? So a big part of synthetic organic chemistry these days focuses on the ability to synthesize, to create single enantiomers. Since all of the enzymes in your body and all of the DNA in your body is chiral, is handed, is a single enantiomer, it makes sense that any molecule that itself has chirality to it is going to interact differently with the DNA or the protein depending on which enantiomer you have. Often we're talking about one enantiomer being an, an active drug and the other enantiomer being inactive or toxic or having other properties. In the case of thalidomide, a drug used for nausea and pregnancy back I think in the 60s or the 50s, I think it was the 60s, one enantiomer fought nausea, the other enantiomer caused birth defects. That was a very bad move. Um, so anyway, there is a huge interest in synthesis of single enantiomers and also in assessment of reactions or of mixtures that are generated synthetically from achiral compounds to figure out what amount of enantiomer do we have, what enantiomeric excess do we have. And so the question I want to spend the last few minutes of the class talking about is how we assess enantiomeric purity. Well, one way I've already talked about is comparison of the specific rotation to an enantiomerically pure sample. One of the obvious limitations of this method is that you have to somehow have an enantiomerically pure sample that you can trust. In other words, you have to know 
that the optical rotation of tartaric acid is 12.4, not 12.3 or 12.5 or whatever. Um, you have to know what the limits are. Another issue, which is a little bit less obvious, is experimental error. Often when people are developing synthetic methods, they're looking for synthetic methods that give greater than 90% enantiomeric excess. And so you're dealing with very small differences in optical rotation to say distinguish 95% EE from 97% EE even though the amount of the wrong enantiomer you're distinguishing might almost be a factor of two. So there are other methods that often get used. Now we have a problem because I said in, in this talking about physical properties, physical chemical properties, enantiomers do not behave differently unless they're interacting with something that is chiral. This is important because it means I can't simply take TLC of two enantiomers on a chiral silica gel and separate them in C2 spots, or HPLC on an a chiral medium, or GC on a chiral medium, a chiral medium. I can't take an NMR spectrum and distinguish them. The NMR spectrum of 2R, 3R tartaric acid is identical to the NMR spectrum of 2S, 3S tartaric acid, that in turn, those in turn, are identical to the NMR spectrum of racemic tartaric acid. Diastereomers differ. Mesotartaric acid has a different NMR spectrum. The CHs in tartaric acid are symmetrical. So you get one CH line for re, uh, racemic uh, or 2R, 3R, or 2S, 3S tartaric acid, and another NMR line in the NMR spectrum, a CH peak, for the meso compound. So those diastereomers I could tell apart very easily. So we can go ahead and dis deliberately prepare diastereomeric derivatives, and I'll show you an example. And if you prepare a diastereomeric derivative, then you can, with a, I'll write out the word, with a chiral derivatizing agent, then you can distinguish the diastereomers by NMR, or by gas chromatography, or by a chiral HPLC, or by TLC. Professor Reknovsky's developed a very clever procedure where you're actually looking at the rate of formation of derivatives, which is also very clever in that case with a chiral catalyst. You can, so this involves covalently connecting a group to your molecule, covalently modifying it. You can also non-covalently modify it. I've used this technique. You use NMR with what's called a chiral shift reagent. Chiral shift reagent is a paramagnetic species that causes peaks to shift in the NMR. And another method you can use is where you have chromatography with a chiral stationary phase. So again, you have those different interactions. So you can do chiral GC or chiral HPLC. So let me in the last few minutes give you a little bit of a flavor of this. And I'll just cite as sort of a very typical example of a problem. 
So a very typical example of a research problem would be, say, to have a ketone. Let's, for example, say 2-octanone. And you're developing some type of chiral reducing agent. And that chiral reducing agent reduces the ketone to an alcohol. And we'll be talking more about the, this concept later on, but this would be an example of a real research problem. And the question you'd be asking is, what is the percent EE? In other words, you want your chiral reducing agent to make just one enantiomer. And so you need some way of telling those enantiomers apart. They're going to have the same retention time in TLC, in HPLC, then if it's achiral, et cetera, on you know, GC, the same NMR spectrum, and you won't be able to tell them apart. But if you go ahead and you use a chiral derivatizing agent, and the classic example is a Mosher ester, Mosher's acid is, so Mosher ester is an ester of, and it's a mouthful, alpha methoxy, alpha trifluoromethyl phenylacetic acid. It's a pretty reagent. Here's the reagent, and I want to show you why it's so pretty. So the reagent that you would use is an acid chloride. And here's our alpha methoxy, and here's our alpha trifluoromethyl, and here's our phenyl. pH just means phenyl. It's a benzene ring. So if you make an ester of this reagent, and I'll just write this as, I'll write it as, I'll show the example. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I'll draw a little squiggly line here to basically indicate that we can have both enantiomers of the alcohol. So now we would have two diastereomers. So now, in the NMR spectrum, you'd get distinct peaks. You'd get a sharp peak for the methoxy of one diastereomer. You'd get a sharp peak for the methoxy of the other diastereomer. In fact, if you carry out fluorine NMR, you'd have nothing else in the NMR spectrum other than the trifluoromethyl groups. So you can analyze by 1H NMR or F19 NMR. And now it's very easy because let's say you see one peak. Let's say I was looking at the NMR spectrum and let's say I see this. So let's say this is what I see in the NMR for the O-methoxy region. And I could slap an integral on it and say, ah, okay, I have 95 to five diastereomers, what would that be in terms of percent EE? 90% EE. In other words, I had 95% of one enantiomer, 5% of the other enantiomer before I prepared diastereomers. Now I get 95 uh, to 5 means 90% EE. All right, I will just pay some lip service to the other ways. So let us talk about chiral shift reagents. <laughs> 
Chiral shift reagents are chiral species that bind to the molecule. So for example, by non-covalent interactions, by coordination, I would have coordination to a europium reagent like EUTFC3. In the NMR, I would then be able to go ahead and see, let's say, the methyl peak here would separate, and I might have one doublet for one and one doublet for the other enantiomer, and I might be able to tell them apart here. Chiral GC and chiral HPLC rely on a chiral stationary phase. And the enantiomers interact differently. You can imagine if I'm at a wedding receiving line and I'm going down shaking people's hands and I extend my right hand and move down the line, I'm going to move differently down the line than if I confuse everybody by having the, my left hand extended while their right hand is out. I will move at a different rate down that receiving line. And the two enantiomers move at a different rate down the chiral column, the cyclodextrin or other column, going and sticking to it differently. And so you will, in the HPLC or the GC trace, get, it won't necessarily be one faster or slower. I mean, I made a hyperbolic example with the wedding receiving line, but here will be your, your trace and you'll be able to quantify the enantiomers. So those are some representative methods. All right, we'll pick up talking about uh, concepts in stereoselectivity, or concepts in stereochemistry. <laughs>